This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Today on Sports Files, I'll recap the Memphis Tigers basketball campaign and look ahead to next season. And I'll do so with a distinguished panel of local media experts. <laughs> The NCAA Men's Basketball Final Four will take place this weekend in Dallas with the national semifinal game slated for Saturday and the title tilt Monday night. Florida will face Connecticut in one game while Kentucky meets Wisconsin in the other. The Memphis Tigers season came to an end a few weeks ago with a third round loss to Virginia. Memphis was 0-3 versus UConn this season and lost a two-point decision to top-ranked Florida at Madison Square Garden. Today I'll be joined by the Commercial Appeals' Jason Smith, Grant Milner from Memphis Roar, and Eli Savoy of Sports 56 and 87.7 FM to look at the good, the bad, and the future of the Tigers. But before we do that, pro baseball is underway, and last week the St. Louis Cardinals formally announced the completion of a deal with the City of Memphis and the Memphis Redbirds Baseball Foundation that will secure the long-term future of minor league baseball in Memphis. In a nutshell, the Cardinals have purchased the Redbirds, and the city of Memphis now owns AutoZone Park. The city will now lease the park to the AAA Redbirds via a long-term lease agreement. In addition, the Cardinals will provide a significant multi-year capital investment in the park. Cardinals general manager John Mozalak was the point man for the Cardinals during months of negotiations, and he spoke to me about the significance of getting the deal ironed out. Well, John, again, congratulations on, on getting this deal finalized. What does it all mean for you guys? Well, first off, I woke up this morning, I literally was just excited to know it's behind us because this has been something that's been years in the making. But what does it mean to, to the St. Louis Cardinals and really what does it mean to the city of Memphis? And I, and I think it's really a win-win for both. As we stated all along, we want to create an environment here that's fan-friendly, fan-inviting, and we really want to just look at sort of changing the environment of what's here. But our ultimate goal is to put a winning product out on that field, a product that fans can take pride in. You look at this ballpark, we think it's a beautiful ballpark and a wonderful location, but we certainly think it could have some enhancements. And so, you know, the timing of that is going to have to change a little bit than the original timeline that we were looking at, but I imagine we can have most of these upgrades in place by 2015. What did you think of all the negotiations with the city, with the council, with the mayor, everybody that was involved in it? A little new to me. Uh, most of my negotiations deal with, with players and, and contracts of that like, but you know, for me, I, I certainly understood what was why they had to do it. Um, this is a partnership, and, and we needed uh, the city to be behind this. Otherwise, I don't think this deal could have happened. So I understand the process, and I'm frankly grateful we went through it, and I'm glad we got it behind us. Having uh, this area be Cardinal country for as long as it's been, the proximity to St. Louis, how important was it to get the deal done, to continue this relationship for many, many years to come? Well. As I've stated before, we've always valued being here in Memphis. We see a lot of synergies be between St. Louis and the city of Memphis and really this region. Um, when we were going through the negotiations, though, if, if we weren't here, we were going to play baseball somewhere. Right. And, uh, you know, at that point, we were looking around where that may have been. But I'm glad we didn't get to that point. I'm glad the St. Louis Cardinals are going to be here in Memphis. And I would really like to see the, the, the brand of the Redbirds continue to grow in conjunction with the St. Louis Cardinals. With the Cardinals owning the Redbirds, how different is that from in years past? Well, I think, you know, from a financial standpoint, you're going to have a little bit of the Cardinal muscle behind this. And you think of some of all the, the financial problems that have existed here in the past, you know, hopefully we can eliminate those and, and really just put that behind us and be thinking more in a more progressive approach to what we need to do here at this ballpark. And our thanks to John Mozalak for joining us. The Redbirds home opener is set for Friday, April 11th. The Cardinals home opener is this Monday, the 7th. And we'll hear from some of the Cardinals about their expectations for the season a little later in the show. Now it's time for our media panel and a discussion on the Memphis Tigers. All right, let's meet the panel. Jason Smith joins us from the Commercial Appeal. Thanks for having me, Greg. Hey, Jason, great to have you. Eli Savoy, Sports 56, 87.7 FM. I kind of know you. That's right. I know you as well. Memphis Roars' Grant Miller joins us as well. Hey, hey Grant. 
couple of couple of weeks removed from the season as we look back at the 2013-14 campaign for the Tigers. How would you assess the season, Jason? Uh, well, usually, obviously, you, you, you look at the five top 25 wins, the winning the Old Spice Classic, a sweep over Louisville, and you'd say great season. But this was a team with Sweet 16 talent. And the way it finished, losing four out of its last seven, not getting to the Sweet 16, which I think uh, was certainly the goal, uh, you'd have to characterize that as a disappointment. Eli? Yeah, I would say it's a disappointment. You ended up as an eight seed, and you just can't do that. With this talent and everything they had coming back, veteran leadership, top 50 recruits, this should be better than an eight seed. So although you had the quality wins, in the end it only got you an eight seed. That's disappointing. Grant, how do you see the season? Well, you know, I think a lot of teams would take it, but given where they had gone the previous seasons and given the amount of talent that they had coming back, the seniors that they had on the team, I think, too, it's a disappointment. You know, I said before the season I thought they needed to make a Sweet 16 for it to be a successful year, and they weren't able to do that. And I think just their, their overall body of work in the regular season was not good enough to get them a better seed. And I think if they had played better throughout the year, then they might have had more of an opportunity to make the Sweet 16. Jason, did we slide them any slack for the – mere reason they changed conferences and became a part of the American, which was very competitive as opposed to years past in Conference USA. I don't think so, just because as Grant and, and, and Eli pointed out, this was a team that had that kind of Sweet 16 talent. They were picked third, obviously, to, to finish in the AAC. Uh, this was a team that had as much talent as any team in the league as far as I was concerned, so I don't think you cut them much slack. Now, this has been a different year, new guys, then maybe so, but I don't think so with this year. We talk a lot, Eli, about expectations. The expectations have always seemed to be high since Josh took over this year especially, and again, they do not live up to the expectations. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you look at the home losses, those were key in that seeding, the loss at the end of the year to Houston, the way they kind of finished. You know, there, there's going to be high expectations when you continue to have top recruiting class year after year after year. Eventually, that's got to turn into Sweet 16's higher seeds in the tournament, and so far it hasn't done it. Grant, I think everybody expected this team to lose some games, especially playing in this new conference, but I think the losses, the double-digit losses, losing at home, that's certainly stuck in the crawl of a lot of fans. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, you look back to, let's say, the Florida loss. They lose by two. Well, the reaction was nowhere close to what it was like when they lost by 20 at Oklahoma State. So I think when you have those you know, sort of avalanches happen, it makes things look a lot worse than maybe it actually was. So, yeah, I agree. The home losses and uh, kind of the blowout losses, if you will, uh, definitely hurt. All right, this question for all three of you guys. Give me two reasons why this team failed to reach the Sweet 16. Jason? Uh, one, I think Josh relied too heavily on his senior guards, and I think he said that in as many words. You know, he said, I, I, I didn't, I misjudged the three-point shooting. I think what he really wanted to say without throwing the guys under the bus was, I put too much stock in these four senior guards. I thought they were uh, better than they ended up being. I also thought, I guess, reason number two would be, you know, you say you're an inside-out team. They obviously played at their best when they were going inside to Austin Nichols and Shaq Goodwin. But by the end of the year, that was on and off, and they weren't that team. They didn't establish that identity. Uh, that's, those are the two reasons I'd say they didn't make it. Eli? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is they never figured out who they were and what they wanted to be and committed to that. At the beginning of the year, they were going to be a pressing team. Then that got scrapped. Then it was the four guards. Then it was we're going to work through the inside. They never really figured out what they were going to be. And at the end of the year, especially, the defense just was, was really bad, and they never quite figured that out either. Grant? Yeah, I think, number one, the defense was was really a problem. You know, at the beginning of the year, they were going to play this up-and-down, helter-skelter type of pace on defense, and they never really stuck to that. And so I think guys were kind of confused at times as, as to what they were going to do on the floor. And then, number two, I think, you know, their identity was mixed. You know, it's, it's like the... The senior guards are the guys we're going to put all our, our eggs in, and then it's like we got to play inside out. So I think guys didn't really know, you know, who the king was, who were they going to go to, and, and how were they going to actually play. And I think those two, you know, characteristics really contributed to the way that the way the season ended. All right, piggybacking on that, let me go back to you, Grant. What's the one ingredient that's missing with this program as we we get ready for the 14-15 season? Moving ahead, moving down the road to the future, what's missing? I think it's mental toughness. You know, you saw a lot of times where they got into a rut, and yeah, they could they couldn't score the ball, but it was like they weren't able to uh, stop teams or overcome these 20 to four runs or 10 to two runs or whatever it was, and they found themselves you know behind the eight ball. And so I think they've got to grow mentally. Yeah, they're you know physically they clearly need to improve in that area too, but I think they've got to get mentally stronger and be able to overcome some of those avalanches as Josh called them throughout the year. Eli, is it more mental than physical? Uh, I think it, I think there is something to that because. 
this team always has trouble overcoming adversity. When they start mm -hmm. getting down, it's a bunch of guys that want to try and hit the 10-point shot, and they it's it, they get away from the team concept of basketball. And so it's got to be instilled into them that when things start going bad, that's their, there needs to be that go-to guy. Who's got to be the guy that when we're in trouble, we need a basket, he's the guy we're going to get the ball to and let him do that for us. I won't argue with what Grant and Eli just said, but let's look at the last couple of years who knocked him out. Virginia, big, strong, physical. Michigan yeah. State, big, strong, physical. How do they become big, strong, physical? Well, I mean, that's Josh has said that. The, the strength and conditioning coach that he hires will be a major hire. It'll be just like hiring, uh, as important as hiring an assistant. Uh, I, I, I agree totally with Grant and Eli. I think, you know, whether, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, it was toughness that this team lacked. Uh, whether it was in times of adversity when they got down and kind of folded, or, or whether it was when they were getting pushed around against Virginia. I think it's both, and perhaps a strength and conditioning coach can help you in both areas. All right, the hot topic when you talk Memphis Tigers basketball is the head coach, is Josh Pastner. Five years as the head coach, so this isn't his, his first rodeo now. He's been here a while. Let me start with Eli. Uh, your assessment on the job that Josh has done overall, and you could be uh, also – um, precise on, on this year. You know, you could separate the two. Five years into his job, and then this specifically this year. I think this year matches the other the other four. And I even don't throw away the first year almost because that was a tough, you know, trying to put together Transition. that team and everything after all the recruits were gone. But they've underachieved every year, pretty much, in my opinion. I, it, every year they have finished the year lower ranked than they started the year. They've never gotten an NCAA tournament seed uh, that matched what I thought they should be capable of doing. I think it's been underachieving in the four years. The real, the, the four years that I really count. And this Grant, year and this year was no different. Okay, and Grant, your assessment well, about Josh. You know, obviously he's won more games in five years than any other coach here. Uh, but I think the, the difference is when you look back at, let's say, when John Calipari started, you know, the, there wasn't the run – you know, prior to it, you know, there wasn't the Cal era those four years from 2006 to 2009 that people had to deal with. So when you look at what they've done now, yeah, it may look like they've underachieved a little bit. And yeah, I, I agree with your point. You know, hey, they've they've started uh, you know the year at a certain mark and and haven't ended up there. So yeah, I think that uh, they have underachieved in some areas. But we got to be sure to to credit Josh for what he has done for the program too. Jason, I think Grant brings up a great point. He's following in the footsteps of John Calipari. Right putting the program at this level. Now, again, he decided to accept RC's offer, and he knew the road would be tough. When you look back at his five years, give me your assessment. I think he's done a solid job. I mean, he, obviously, this was a guy who got the job when he was 31, uh, didn't expect to get the job, was, was on his way to Kentucky, he turns around, and he's the head coach at Memphis. Uh, when you look at the overall you know, body of work, I'd say it's been pretty solid. Obviously, this team, this program is judged on how far it gets in the NCAA tournament, so he takes a knock there. I agree with Eli that they've underachieved in most seasons, except for year two, I'd say, when Joe and Will Barton, all those guys were freshmen. They nearly beat Arizona in the, right. in the, uh, in the second round of the tournament. But overall, and especially with the talent they had this year, you separate that one. Yeah, it's a down year, so you look at it and you say, yeah, not so good. But overall, I'd give them a, you know, a, solid, a solid B B minus. As everybody knows, Josh is a re relentless recruiter. He has terrific recruiting coaches on his staff. But there is some areas where there's a deficiency. There's no question. Jason Gardner has recently decided to go to IUPUI as the head coach. There's an, at least one opening that we know of. Who knows if Aki Collins or Robert Kirby or both will get opportunities this summer. What do you think should happen? Because Josh has leaned on former uh, players that he played with or coached at Arizona. And Damon Stoudemire lasted two years. Uh, Gardner lasted one. Luke Walton didn't last a year. Right. Where should they go to fill the void? Jason, you know, some people say X's and O's. I, you know, I won't, I won't dispute that. I will disagree with that. I think what they've got to do is get a defensive-minded guy. With the way this team played defense, especially this year, I mean, it's, I'd say Josh's worst year in terms of defensive. Uh, how good this team was defensively. I think you got to get a guy with an X's and O's guy, but someone that knows defense, uh, knows how tough you've got to be to play it, and somebody that can kind of concentrate in that area. Eli, I think I like that idea. I think you got to get somebody defensive, and I would actually like to see somebody who is in the in their past has had a, a kind of a zone background because I still think that this team's probably going to have to play zone with Nick King and Austin Nichols if you think there's some defensive deficiencies there you may have to play a lot more zone go get a guy you know that has some background with the, a zone type background defensively and I think that would be really good a really good fit Greg do you think he's willing to bring somebody in that has different ideas that he would sit there and listen and maybe 
use some of those ideas? I think he is, absolutely. Uh, I do think that losing Jack Murphy a couple of years ago was a hurt for their, their staff. I, I think agree. he was a, an X's and O's guy that, that they certainly use, <clears throat> used and utilized you know, plenty. But I think they've got to get a defensive-minded coach. I think the defense, you know, maybe in the last couple of years has looked better than it was because of a guy like D.J. Steffens. Mm -hmm. And this year some things were probably exposed because he made up for a lot of those errors on the perimeter. Um, so, yeah, I think defense has got to be a key when he's looking for a – you know, that third spot on the staff. It's got to be somebody he trusts, though. I mean, that, that's the big thing. It's got to be something. Josh has to be willing to take somebody's ideas and let them have a voice and say, and maybe make some changes. It's, so it's got to be somebody he trusts and is willing to accept what they tell him. Well, Without question, he can't be looking over his shoulder thinking, does this guy want my job down the road? Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, he's brought in a lot of younger guys that, ha you know, haven't had the experience. And so I think maybe he looks and I'm not saying this is exactly what's happened, but he may say, okay, I've, I've been doing this longer than he has. So I'm not going to maybe value what his input as much as I would a guy that's been, you know, an assistant coach for 10, 15 years or even been a head coach at times. Well, we, we know he trusts his Arizona guys. He's hired four yeah, no of them question. since he's been here, and maybe that's maybe it'll be a fifth one for this uh, for this Gardner spot. Jason, there's no question that Josh uh, is looking all over the country for recruits, but for the most part, his recruiting base has come out of the city of Memphis. Yep. John Calipari went elsewhere. He stayed pretty much away from the city of Memphis. You've been here a long time. You covered preps for the commercial appeal before he became the Tigers beat writer for the CA. How would you assess the whole overall prep scene in Memphis? Are these players overrated? I think you bring up a great point. I think it's a great question. I, you know, I was one of those guys having covered preps for seven years for the CA before I got the Tigers job uh, that thought, you know, Memphis talent is as good as any in the country. And I believe that's true to an extent. But I, I do. I get the feeling that, that, you know, after years of surveying it, that it might be a little bit overrated. I think some of these guys, you know, it's, it's, there's a tendency to listen to the outside guys. And I know that's true for everyone in the country these days with social media, those kind of things. But something about Memphis players here lately, uh, I don't know if, they're, if I'd call them prima donnas, but they all certainly think they're Superman. They all certainly think that they can be the lead guy in a program. And it, they just seem to lack a mental toughness, at least – the overall guy. Now, I think Austin Nichols has got plenty of, of mental toughness. I think we'll see that Markel Crawford does. But when you talk about Joe Jackson, Chris Crawford, Tariq Black, even when he's here, those guys were a little fragile mentally. Uh, and I think that's where we kind of, you know, may be wrong on the ratings is, is how, much, how much are we judging heart and mental toughness? Eli, does that go hand in hand with the fact that they're from here, they're inner circle, the pressure of performing? I think it's it's definitely harder when you're playing in, in your own hometown because you do have so many people around you that when you have a bad game or you don't play enough minutes, you got a lot of people telling you that you should be playing more, you should be getting more shots. There's constantly people in your ear putting pressure on you and telling you, uh, what, you know, how you're being held back or something like that by a coach. All right, Grant, in our final few minutes, I'm going to get your thoughts as well, guys. I know you do a lot with the recruiting. You follow what's going on with Memphis. Let's take for a second Austin Nichols and Shaq Goodwin out of the equation. We know that they'll be there and be called upon and have to be integral parts of this team for them to do well. Give me two or three other names of guys that are going to need to step up very quickly next year for Memphis to have any chance to put together a really good season. I think it's got to be Nick King. You know, I think he's going to see an extended amount of minutes next year, certainly more than he did this year. He only played about uh, 11 minutes a game. So I think Nick's got to be a guy that steps up, whether that's at the three or in, you know, times at the four also. Um, I think, you know, right now the guard position is wide open, the one and the two. So whether that's Pookie Powell who steps up maybe and comes in at point guard or, you know, Markel Crawford, they're transitioning him to the point guard role right now. But they've got to have some guys step up in the backcourt because all of a sudden you're going to have literally no experience uh, in that area versus this year where you had four senior guards who had, you know, been through the trials and tribulations of college basketball. Eli, you're a big fan of Nick King. I know that. I love Nick King. I thought he should have played more this year. I certainly thought he should have played more at the three position this year. Um, but the, the biggest question is the point guard spot. Hey, you got you, Once you figure out who that is, that's the person who's got to step up. They got to have somebody to run this because you are going to be relying so much on the bigs with Shaq and, and Austin. Who's running that offense to get them the basketball? That's what's got to be determined. So it could very, very well be Pookie Powell that has to be the guy that steps up. Jason? I, I agree with both these guys. I think the point guard spot is key. I mean, obviously, they're going to be a team that's, that's strength is in the front court next year, but someone's got to get those guys the ball. And right now, they don't have anyone that's proven at that position. Uh, obviously, Nick King is a guy who I, I agree with Eli. Should have played more minutes. It was Josh's dependence on those four senior guards. I think that kind of deterred his development. He could have been an all AAC rookie guy. Uh, he is that good, especially around the basket. But And then you look at a guy named Dominique Woodson. I, I think they really need him back in terms of adding depth 
to that front court. Yes, they're strong there in the front with Austin and Shaq, but you've got to have some guys to back them up. They had four senior guards, but really no a clear-cut leader out there. Now we're talking about these youngsters. Can one of these guys, Pookie Pal, Markel Crawford, somebody step up and be a leader as a redshirt freshman or as a true freshman? Grant? Well, I think at times there were there were several guys that wanted to be the leader, and I'm not sure how that meshed. You know, you'd have maybe Michael Dixon talking in the huddle one time, then it'd be Joe Jackson, then it would be Shaq Goodwin. Well, I think next year Shaq will probably be that voice. And I know, you know, that there won't be any experience in the backcourt really next year, but you know, let's be honest, they turned the ball over a lot this year with a lot with four senior guards. Right, so, right. you know, my point is they may turn it over a lot next year, but I still think they can make do with what they have. Jason, real quick, what about Karan Iverson? There's all the talent in the world. He's got a I, – I, I was surprised at how bought in he was at the end of the season in practices. I really thought this was a guy who possibly, you know, obviously a top 35 talent, didn't play hardly at all this year, might be a guy that would transfer. But he was bought in at the end of the year, and I think you've got to bring him along. The question is where do you play him? I mean, obviously you, you would think right now Nick King's got the inside edge at the three. Uh, where will Karan play? Is he going to be okay with being a backup guy next year? Uh, but they've got to develop him. From 15 feet and in, Karan Iverson's got all kind of talent, and you've got to find a way to tap into it. Our final minute. A lot of these recruits are still big time recruits. But with that said, with a young team with a lot of inexperience, yes or no, will they be preseason top 25? For their own good, they better not be. They better not be, yeah. right? Yeah, I'll stick with that. Eli? Uh, I think they probably will be. I think they'll probably be down there towards the bottom of the top 25. Wow. Grant? I don't think so. I think they'll be outside the top 25, which I think will obviously help them uh, down the road based on the past results when they've started inside that ranking. Four new guys coming in other than the redshirt freshman three junior college guys, and a true freshman, Dominic McGee. Real quick, Grant, I know, you, again, you, you study this. Who's going to be the most impactful? I think Treshawn Burrell. He's third in the nation in junior college this year. He can fill that vo void at the two spot right away. He's six seven, kind of a Will Barton st style of player. I like him. Grant, Eli, Jason, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thanks we for We appreciate it. We'll take a break. Overtime is coming up next. As promised, time to return to our baseball discussion and the hopes of the St. Louis Cardinals in 2014. Last year, the Cards won the National League pennant, advancing to the World Series before getting knocked off by the Boston Red Sox. The 11-time World Series champs are hoping to return to the promised land, and they certainly have the roster to do so. But with that said, they know saying so and doing so are altogether two different things. I mean, you always have that expectation to hopefully get to the big leagues by the end of the season, and uh, you know, for that to happen was awesome for me and, you know, really allowed me to understand what it was like to be up there and uh, learn from it. Uh, you know, you always want to understand that, you know, you were so close and, you, you know, you had that taste in your mouth of how close you were and that you never want to lose it. But then again, you know, this is a fresh year. It's a, basically a new team and, you know, we're excited to see what, you know, we can do. You know, we, we did good in the offseason. You know, we, we picked up a lot of a lot of key players that, that are really, really good for our club, you know, and um, we just got to go out there and, and play each day and uh, the results will the results will show. What are your expectations individually? Uh, just to, to be a good team guy, you know, go out there and um, do everything that I can to, to help the ball club uh, be in a good position at the end of nine innings to, to get the W. How about being back in Memphis? It's a lot of fun, you know. Uh, this ballpark's really nice, you know. Uh, the, the fans are great, so it's, it's something to, to come back out here on this field and, and play against some of the buddies that, that we had in Big League Camp. It says a lot about uh, really good organizations that they don't uh, live on their past and they're they're always looking to improve. And, and you guys went out and made some key moves and brought in some more players and got some more speed. And, and this is a sign of a great organization. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as everyone's read, uh, it's sort of the organization, a lot of teams are, and organizations are trying to follow after. We have, you know, a lot of good young players and, and more coming. And, and uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's ran really well, and, and uh, they continue to strive for a championship on a yearly basis. I like, uh, I like how, how, we, uh, how we finished, how we competed. Guys uh, came in in great shape, and, and uh, most of them finished that way too. And, and, um, 
We're ready to go. It's time. Is there a different feeling coming out this year, getting ready for the season, as opposed to last year when it was a little bit more unknown? You went to the series, and now you come back with some changes, but a lot of confidence, I'm sure. Yeah, I think um, you always have the unknowns. You never know how a club's going to come together once uh, the red bell rings, and you know, we'll find out on Monday. But right now, uh, everybody's going about it the right way. They've worked hard. They've they prepared. They've done everything they can do up to this point. We couldn't ask them to do any more, and now it's just a matter of grinding it out for 162 games. And while baseball is just getting underway, the NBA is getting down to crunch time as the Grizzlies battle to get back to the playoffs. The good guys will host Denver tomorrow night, their first home game after a five-game Western road swing. The Grizzlies have only seven games left in the regular season. And that'll do it for this week. Remember, if you want to see any of our previous shows, all you have to do is go to our website, WKNO.org, and click on KNO Tonight. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.